Well, hello, and welcome back to another episode. It's great to see you all. I hope you're doing well. So today, as promised last week, what we're going to talk about is linear least squares, and in particular, in the context of how we can go about solving systems of equations where we have more equations than we have unknowns. And I'll, I'll let you into a little secret on this. Actually, I wasn't going to talk about the derivation of the equation for linear least squares because I thought, well, that's just too much. It's a bit out of out of context for my channel. But um, yeah, actually, it's kind of cool. When I really sat down and, and worked through it, I thought, you know what, this is kind of cool. So I have included that. So there's a section at the beginning which covers the derivation of the equation for linear least squares. And then after that, we go on to look at how we can implement that in C++ code as we do normally. So I really hope that will be of interest. And yeah, and uh, I always like to keep my introduction short. So I'll just say quickly before we get started that if you like this video, please do remember to hit that like button. And if you haven't done so already, please consider of subscribing to my channel so you don't have to miss any future videos. I do try and make a video roughly once a week, so if you subscribe, you don't need to worry about missing anything. Thank you very much. Anyway, without much further ado, let's jump to it and let's go and see what we can learn about linear least squares. So, just to quickly recap what we have talked about before. We started out quite a few episodes ago now, link in the description below of course, looking at linear systems of equations and in particular we looked at some example systems with three equations and three unknowns. We expressed those in general form as shown here. We then saw that this could be written in vector notation as so, and then that we could rearrange this to give an equation for the vector x that we want to know. And we discussed how we could solve that system of equations by either computing the inverse of the matrix A or by using Gauss-Jordan elimination. But what would happen if we had more equations than unknowns? In that case, our system would look something like this. In this case, we have four equations in only three unknowns. Can we still solve this the same way? To do so, we would have to compute the inverse of A, which, if you recall, we cannot do because we can only compute the inverse of square matrices, and A is no longer square because it has four rows and three columns. So what can we do? This is an example of what is known as an overspecified system, where we have n observations for k unknowns, with n greater than k. Problems such as this actually crop up rather often, probably more often than you might think. Let's consider an example of such a problem that involves fitting a line to some data, a process otherwise known as linear regression. We can start with looking at the simplest possible example of fitting a line to just two points at 1,2 and 3,4. Of course, a line is completely and uniquely described by two points, so we will always be able to compute a line of exact fit in this situation. We will base our model on the classic equation for a line given by y equals mx plus c. We can rearrange this to be in terms of y like this. And now we can express our two points in this form. And so we can see that the values for our unknowns c and m will be given by this equation which we can solve quite easily by first computing the inverse, as we see here, and then solving for the values of c and m, which both come out as 1. These are the values we would intuitively expect from looking at the points that we started with. And if we plot the line given by y equals x plus 1, we can see that it passes through the two points, just as we expected it to. This is actually an example of linear regression. Usually, we would be trying to find the line of best fit to a large number of points, perhaps something similar to this situation shown in this example plot. Every point here counts as one observation and contributes one row to our system. In the more general case, for n points, our system would look like this, assuming we have two unknowns, as is the case for fitting a line. We can also express this as the individual equations, but generally the vector form is preferred because it is easier. One important thing to note is that the first column of the x matrix is all 1s. This is because of the constant term c in the model equation that we are using, y equals mx plus c. It is very common for a linear model to have a constant term, so it is normal to arrange the x matrix in this way with the first column containing just 1s. In the general case, it is unlikely that there will be an exact solution for c and m, so our aim is to find the best estimate c hat and m hat. 
For each equation, we know that if we did know C and M exactly, then we would have this result, that Y minus C plus MX is equal to zero, or in vector notation, Y minus X beta equals zero, where beta is the vector of our unknowns C and M. Now, for our estimated values of C hat and M hat, we have that Y minus C plus NX equals R, where R is called the residual. Our goal is to find the values of C hat and M hat that result in R being as close to zero as possible. And we want to do this for all of the equations in our system, one for each point. So we aim to minimize the sum of squared residuals given by this equation. The fact that we are minimizing the sum of squared residuals is why the technique is called linear least squares. If we consider the vector form of the equation for the residual, we get that r equals y minus x beta, as we would expect. We can then form the sum of squared residuals by multiplying the transpose of r by r, which gives the sum of squares through the process shown here. So if we substitute the equation for r into this, we get that r transpose r is equal to this, which we can rearrange and expand to give this function of beta hat. Our aim is to minimize the function with respect to beta, which means to find the value beta hat that gives the smallest possible value for the function f. To find the minimum, we differentiate this function with respect to beta hat to give the result shown here, which we can set equal to zero as this would correspond to the minimum. We can then rearrange this to give the result shown here for beta hat. And that is the key result. Actually, I think this is pretty amazing, as without making any assumptions at all about our data or system of linear equations, we have arrived at a general expression for the best estimate of beta that fits our model to our data. As results in mathematics go, I think that this one is really quite cool. So, firstly, compare this with the equation that we started with, x equals a to the minus 1b. Although, of course, we used a slightly different notation uh, then where x was the vector of unknowns. But anyway, in that case, we solved for x by finding the inverse of the matrix A. And of course, we could only do that if A was square. But now notice that x transpose x, as in the equation here for linear least squares, is always square. That means that we can compute the inverse even for situations where we have more equations than unknowns, or in the case of an overdetermined system. There is one caveat to all of this, and we do require that all of the rows and columns of x are linearly independent, or in other words, we require that the x matrix be full rank. So let's consider a simple example of this in action, and we'll start with the example that we saw before, except that we're going to add one extra point at 2,4. Now, we can use linear regression to compute the line of best fit between these three points. So, to start with, the three points give us the following, which is in the form of y equals x beta. Our goal is to compute beta hat according to the equation for linear least squares using values for y, x, and x transpose, as shown here. If we put the values for y, x, and x transpose into the equation, we get this result at the top. We can then work through this step by step, firstly by computing the multiplication x transpose and x, as shown on the second line. We can then find the inverse of this, as shown on the third line, and then we can simply multiply this inverse by x transpose, giving us the result on the bottom line. And if we solve that equation, we get estimated values for C and M of 1.330 and 1.000 respectively. If we plot those along with the positions of the three points, we can see that this is indeed the line of best fit. And that is actually all that we need to know. Now, with the tools that we have already developed as part of our linear algebra library, implementing linear least squares is really easy. All that we need to add is a function to QB matrix 2 to compute the transpose, and then it is simply a matter of using the linear least squares equation that we have just seen. So let's take a look at how we can do that now. Right, so actually, as I've just said, the additions and changes that we need to make to the code to actually implement a linear least squares using this method are really quite minimal. Um, I have, however, made some minor changes to the QB matrix uh, class. One thing, of course, adding a function to allow us to transpose a matrix, but I also made a change to the code we wrote to handle the situation of matrix multiplied by a vector. So let's just have a look at that first. So if we go and find that code, that will be further down in our overloaded operator section. So here we have the section of code here. This function is responsible for the condition where we multiply a matrix by a vector. 
And one of the things that I've done now is use the new functionality to the QB vector class that we added in the previous episode. So what happened before is it, it set up a QB ve vector object for the output called result that was simply set to be a copy of the vector from the right hand side. And the reason I did it that way was so that it would initialize it to be the right size and then we would go through and modify the elements of it anyway. So I figured actually that that would be okay. But working on the linearly squares code that I've been doing now, I realized that of course that's not going to work because it means that the output vector is not necessarily going to be the right size. So when everything was all square, we're dealing with square matrices and everything else, everything, you know, it was completely fine, which is why I didn't notice that bug before. But once we start dealing with non-square matrices, as we're doing now, of course, we get the situation where it's entirely possible that the size of the output vector is going to be different to the size of the vector from the right hand side. So what we do now is we use the new constructor that we talked about in the previous episode that simply allows us to create a an empty vector of a specified size and we simply do that we configure it to have the same number of elements as we have number of rows in the left hand side matrix and that's it that is actually all of the modification that we needed to do for that the only other thing then that I've done is added the transpose function, which is uh, defined here. So this is back up at the top of our file. Uh, we have QB matrix two of type T uh, function is called transpose, accepts no input parameters. It's simply going to perform the transpose on the matrix that we have and going to return the result as a, an output QB matrix two object. Uh, let's just have a very quick look at that. It's really um, quite short, as I'm sure you can imagine, actually. I mean, doing a matrix transpose is not uh, particularly difficult. Let's go for the determinant, the inverse. Uh, here we are. Compute and return the transpose. So it's a function obviously called transpose. It returns a QB matrix 2 of type T object. Um, the first thing we do is we form the output matrix and note the reverse order of uh, rows and columns as of course it's going to be the transpose. So we have QB matrix 2 of type T result matrix and we size it to, to M underscore N calls, M underscore N rows. So it's going to have the same number of elements, but the rows and columns are switched around. Okay, and then we're going to loop through the elements and copy in the appropriate order. And really it's that simple. We simply loop I and J through the rows and the columns. And then we have result matrix dot set element J I, that's important. And then we set that element to uh, the current element of the current matrix, which you get from the this pointer uh, at IJ. And that's it. It's really very simple. And so then return the result matrix. And there you go. That's how we calculate the transpose. Um, it's really very basic indeed. So let's move on and have a look at the code to actually implement linear least squares which we can find here. So I've done this as a new function because I'm using templates for everything. As I've said before, I'm doing all of these in header files. Uh, depending on your system, you may want to call these .hpp rather than .h. I've called them .h and that works for me. Uh, some people have said that they have had uh, problems with that and so I, I believe some compilers uh, get a bit upset if you use C++ code inside .h files and you have to call them .hpp but anyway so I've simply called this uh, qblsq.h and uh, there we go so we bring in things that we need we need qb vector and we need qb matrix as I've mentioned before I'm referring to this slightly weird path for the qb vector class simply because of the way I organize my code with the videos um, it's in a slightly different uh, folder or directory to where we are ultimately we're going to bring all of this together into one library we just haven't quite got that far yet um, we define as we saw before using a constants expression an error code for the condition where we have no uh, computable inverse uh, we simply set that to minus one and then we have the actual QBLSQ function here, which is, as you can see, very, very short. That's all that it is. Uh, we simply declare a type name T. We return an integer. In fact, actually, we don't. <laughs> I, I should uh, do something that return um, one. OK. If we're successful, we return one. There we go. Um, so we return an integer the function is called QBLSQ. We accept as input a const of QB matrix two of type T, or a reference to X input to X in, and a const QB vector T, um, a reference to Y in. So that's X and Y from our system. And we also accept as input a reference uh, to a QB vector of type T object called result that we are going to use to store the result. 
Okay, so the first thing that we need to do is make a copy of x and y. Um, at the moment, we sort of need to do that because I haven't perhaps got all my consts in the right place uh, with various things. So we're, we're declaring these inputs at x in and y in as const. And to make the code work at the moment, I'm just making copies of those internally. It's a little bit inefficient to do it that way, really. And I think if I, I will one day go through and refactor all of the code and we'll get the consts and everything exactly right. And then it might not actually be necessary to do that. But anyway, for now, that's what we need to do. So we declare a new QB matrix to a type T object called X and a new QB vector a type T object called Y and we simply copy X in and Y in into those. Uh, we then obviously compute the transpose of X. So we use the transpose function that we've just been talking about to generate a new QB matrix to a type T object called XT, which is simply equal to X dot transpose. And then we compute X times X transpose, which I've written as XXT, which of course is a new QB matrix to object simply as X transpose XT times X. That's all we need to do because we've already um, I think right back to one of the, the first episode in this series we talked about matrix multiplication so we've already taken care of that and we then compute the inverse of that and we check that it's actually successful so if not xxt dot inverse remember the inverse function that we created works in place it doesn't return the inverse of the matrix it inverts the matrix that you already have okay so bearing that in mind so we simply do if not xxt dot inverse then we return qblsq underscore no inverse error code that we've defined up here otherwise we carry on and then we simply multiply the inverse xxt by x transpose uh, to give us xxt xt so that's x x transpose i have actually called those wrong haven't i <laughs> i mean it doesn't matter but x x transpose there should be x transpose x that should be xt x really i'm not i'm not going to change it now in the same here that should be xt xt but never mind um it, it it's pretty academic what we call our variables anyway uh, what's important of course is that they do correspond to the correct calculations which they do this is uh, x transpose x that we calculated here uh, multiplied by x transpose and then we simply multiply that by y and that gives us the result it is astonishingly simple to implement and yet it's something that is so incredibly powerful um, you know you can use this I've only sort of looked at some very simple examples in two unknowns but you can use this to solve really complex and difficult problems and it's so easy to implement once you've got the base of the code in place that we've been working on in the previous nine episodes and there we go. So we just simply return that result multiplied by y, and there we go. OK, so the last thing really to talk about is how we go about testing this code. So let's have a look at the test code that I've created. So this is here. I've created a new um, function here um, for testing our code, which is called testcode underscore qblsq.cpp. This is a CPP file, not a header file. Obviously, we need to make sure we hash include qblsq.h to be talking about, and we need QB matrix and QB vector as well. Um, a note, I do using use using namespace std just for my test code. This is really bad practice, and generally speaking, I would never do this. The I just do it here because I'm using a lot of C outs and endls and so on, and it's easy, but I would only ever do that in this sort of situation where we're just doing the test code. OK, so we have our functions print matrix and print vector. We've talked about those before in previous episodes, so I'm not going to talk about those now. And then we come to int main. Entry point of our code, we simply tell the user what we're doing. Um, so first off, test the transpose code that we've just written. It seems basic, but it's a good idea to test it. So we set up some simple data for a matrix, and we put that into a QB matrix 2 object. We print the original, and we print the transpose version. Very simple, and verify the dimensions that the rows and columns have indeed swapped around. OK, I mean, that's basic. Um, note that I've started doing this in my test code, of putting each test inside um, the scope uh, limiter scope operators like that simply so that we don't get problems with defining multiple variables and things like that so it just makes things easier to organize in in my opinion uh, and then we come down to testing linear least squares itself so we do inside the scope operator again here look uh, we have our test one we define a very simple x matrix here and our y data you'll note that this corresponds to the situation with the three points that we were just looking at in the example in the slides and then we print testing with x and we do print matrix x print vector y and then we calculate the result in test equals qblsq type double x y and result 
uh, result, of course, being simply a QB vector object of type double. And that's it. And then we did, that gives us beta hat in result, and we just print vector result, and we're done. And then I did a slightly more complicated test that uh, works with a larger number of equations. So we can specify how many equations. In this case, we've done 100. We specify M and C. We are at the moment only testing with two unknowns. Um, I haven't done any more extensive testing on this code yet. And it's really important. Do, do please pay attention to that. What I'm hoping to do is to go on to look at using this in some more complicated, and more interesting situations. But that's going to come in the next video. And of course, in doing that, I'm going to test the code more thoroughly and if anything uh, comes up that I spot any problems with it I will talk about those in the next video but for now for testing with two unknowns um, this everything seems to work as it should anyway we define our unknowns so that we actually do know them m and c is 1.5 and a half um, and then we simply set that up we want an x range of 0 to 10 or 0 to 9 with 100 points in between so we define everything we need for that and then we create our QB matrix 2 object called X and our QB vector object called Y. And then we're going to simply loop X from 0 to X max, which is 10, um, using X step that we calculated here. We generate a random number, double random number. I think I've talked about uh, this methodology here, for this method for generating random numbers before. So we pull out a random number. We do X dot set element count comma 0 comma 1. So that is setting the 0th or the first column which is all going to be one, as we saw in the slides in this situation. The first column of the X matrix will always be one because it corresponds to the constant term in the equation we're using for our model. And then we do X dot set element count comma one comma X, which sets the second column of the X matrix to our values of X, which are simply going to linearly increase from zero up to X max. And then we simply set our elements of y, so y dot set element count, and we calculate the value as mx plus c, the classic line equation y equals mx plus c, and we add our random number. And then we increment count, because we need an integer count there just for those. And that's it. And that generates the data we're going to use for our test. I've then got code here to display those if you want to, and also code here to write those out to a CSV file. So this is what I use to create the um, example figure as an example of linear regression that we saw in the slides just now. I wrote those out to a CSV file. You can then look at those in any spreadsheet application or plot them in GNU plot or something like that, whatever you want to do. Um, but then we're just going to apply the linear least squares method. We create a QB vector object called beta hat and we simply do int test equals QB LSQ of type double x y comma beta hat and that's it. And then we print vector beta hat and hopefully that's going to give us the right result. So let's have a look at what happens when we actually go about testing it. So I'm at my terminal window. The first thing we need to do, of course, is to compile. So we do GP plus plus minus O test code underscore QBLSQ. And we're going to compile test code underscore QBLSQ dot CPP. And I always use minus STD equals C plus plus 17. So we run that. And our code compiles. And if we run it, test code underscore QBLSQ then we get this result. So let's just have a look at everything that's here. So it does all fit on one screen. So we test our matrix transpose first. Makes sense, right? So we start with this original matrix here, one which is uh, three rows by four columns. And then we get a result that is four rows by three columns, which is exactly as we would expect. And if you look the first row here, one three minus 113 corresponds to the first column here and so on. You can see easily that that's working and we can verify the dimensions as well. The original is three by four and the transpose version is four by three. That's exactly what we would expect. I haven't done any more extensive testing as that. I, I do believe that that indicates that it's <laughs> working properly but listen I mean as always um, you know I can't guarantee that my code is completely bug free if you do spot anything do please let me know in the comments and I'll be sure to uh, uh, either make a video about it or at least uh, put something in the description anyway and then we do the actual testing of the linear least squares itself we're testing with x matrix here of one 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 two three this is the same example we used back in the slides when we worked it out manually and y of two four four and that gives beta hat at 1.333 and 1.000 which is the same value that we got when we did this manually so that's good and we then test with a larger number of equations which gives beta hat at 0 0.568 and um, and 1.488. Now, if you remember, we used values of C of 0 0.5 and a value of M of 1.5. So very clearly, those are quite close. And indeed, I think really quite close enough. 
And there we go. I mean, that's really uh, what I wanted to cover today. So we've seen the the theory behind how linear least squares works. It is, in my opinion, really, really cool. I love this kind of thing in maths where without having to make any assumptions about your data or anything else, you, you can actually just derive uh, an equation that will work and solve any system subject to really a very, very limited number of, of caveats. And I think that's really tremendously <laughs> exciting. Um, there we go, but maybe that's just me. Anyway, um, there we are, linear least squares. So there we go, that's really everything I wanted to talk about today. We've looked at the theory behind linear least squares and we've looked at the derivation of the equation for linear least squares and as I said in the video before that, I think that's actually really rather cool as, as results in mathematics go. I think that's, that's really quite a nice one. And we've looked at how we can implement that in C++ code, which is really easy now that we've got all of the bulk of the code done for our linear algebra library so far. So there wasn't really that much there extra that we needed to do. Anyway, as I say, I think that's enough for today. So I really hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, please do remember to hit that like button. And if you haven't done so already, please consider subscribing to my channel. Anyway, I uh, really hope you've enjoyed the video. It's been a great deal of pleasure making it. And I really look forward to seeing you in the next one. Thank you very much for watching. Bye.